Good afternoon. I'd like to introduce myself. I'm Congressman Morrill, Justin Smith Morrill. This is uh, June 28, 1862. Uh, we do, to give you just a bit of a background, though I'm sure you all are very acquainted with the fact that there's 34 states in the Union. This is rather new. We did have 33, but with the, with the uh, addition of West Virginia recently, we now have 34 states in the Union. And the population is about 20, 27 and a half million individuals, uh, 23 million of which uh, were born in this country. About a half a million uh, residents are uh, enslaved African Americans uh, with another, or, uh, excuse me, four million enslaved uh, African Americans with a half a million freed blacks. Now I brought along the wheat to remind everyone as you know, and I suspect that probably the majority of you are uh, work, uh, work on the farm or uh, some relation to the farm. Majority of the population in this country do work on a farm or those uh, occupations associated with it, such as milling uh, or uh, cooperage. And of course, that is uh, the crating of the barrels since most, uh, most commodities, whether there be produce like flour or clothing or uh, other, other items are actually uh, packaged and transported in barrels, wooden barrels and crates. And I might also remind you that it is a mere 62 years since the passing of uh, His Excellency President Washington. I want to give you just a bit of a background in terms of uh, where I come from and, and uh, some of the influences that I have and then we'll get into the uh, into the legislation that I've just recently uh, gotten passed and some that I've hoped to have pa uh, passed and signed in the next day or two. Uh, I do come from Stratford, uh, Vermont, which is uh, in Orange County in the southern part of Vermont. Now, I don't have to remind you that Vermont was not one of the original 13 states. And so when we moved there as a family, when my great-grandfather moved there, it was actually uh, unsettled territory and was being fought over by uh, New York and, and uh, New Hampshire and it was really assumed that, uh, that New York would just annex it and it would be part of, of New York. There are mountains down the middle of, uh, uh, middle of Vermont so not unlike uh, the north and the south in this country and the little confrontations that they're having right now that there's some confrontation in, in the legislature and all between the east and the west part of, uh, of Vermont. Well, there's a number of children in my family, and as we grew up, we went to school. My mother and my father are very dedicated to us children going to school. Unfortunately, there was not enough money to send all of us to school, uh, to college, so my father, being very fair like he is, decided that none of us should go. So, I had a choice. Now, I was provided an opportunity to be a teacher. It would be $11 a month to pay, uh, to get paid and room and board to be a teacher. However, one of the, uh, one of the individuals that owns a store in Stratford, Ms. Judge Harris, encouraged me that perhaps it would do me better rather than being a teacher to go into, the bi to go into business. Now I will say I wasn't doing it for the money because all he would pay, all they would pay is room and board. However, it is to uh, eventually have a great influence on my future career, my future life, and some of the legislation that I'm working on and various different activities. I went to, to went to work in in the store there, and uh, worked there a couple of years, and then uh, went up to Maine with my brother, and we worked up there, and I. Uh, I actually uh, was a bookkeeper for a while, but they thought I'd probably do better uh, more in just general sales. And then after a couple of years, came back, and uh, within a year or so, I went to Mr. Ha Judge Harris, and I worked for him, and then we went into partnership. It was Harris and Morrill uh, Company. And now, Mr. Morrill, what I gained from him was more than just an occupation or just working in the store. First of all, Working in the store was a great thing. 
if you go into a store, it's not like a general store that you may go into some of these big cities like Washington City here. No, this is more of a general store where you have the pot-bellied stove and the individuals sitting around and anything and everything that might be discussed and be an issue of the day was discussed there. Believe me, I heard the arguments, the discussions, the means of compromise. So I got a real education from the age of 15 on uh, as to how people get together and what are the strong issues. Because people up in Vermont are rather, uh, I won't say bullheaded, but rather strong in their opinion. Well, another thing uh, for Judge Harris that was a great influence is I love to learn and I love to read and perhaps this dates back from when my father couldn't send me to college, but Miss Judge Harris had books and ju the judge would lend me books and allow me to read. So any time in the night, late into the night, I was working during the day at the store, but late into the night by candlelight or Sunday afternoons after, after a meeting, then I would go and I would read. I would read and read and consume about every book that I could consume to learn. Well, after working in the store for a number of years, about 1848, just a few years ago, I decided that I had worked sufficiently and I retired. I was 38 years old and I retired. Went back, bought myself a farm, built myself a house and got married in 1851 to lovely Ruth. We retired and we grew flowers and I was very, very happy to just relax and be retired for the rest of my life. Well, it just about happened in 1855 that our congressman from Vermont happened to pass on, and unbeknownst to me, they just about drafted me into that position. I had never really held a political position before. Oh, some local little uh, 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 participation in political offices. Now, I, I am Whig, or I was formerly Whig, and that's recently uh, changed. Uh, it pretty well died and now we have the Republican Party. So us people up there in the North, we're strong Republicans and I'm a Republican. And they drafted me and I was elected to finish out the term in 1855 up on the Hill. Well, I showed up here. I love this city. I look over, you can look over here and you can see this lovely Washington Monument. Unfortunately, here it is in 1855 and it's just a stump. They got it built part way, but about four years ago, they ran out of money. Didn't have any money in the treasury to build it anymore. So it's just sitting there as a stump. If you look the other way, you'll see this fine Capitol building. Now, unfortunately, it's unfinished as well. It has no dome. But I have heard the president say that in spite of the war and in spite of the sh short funds of the, ca of, of the treasury, that he is intent to put a dome on that lovely building up there. So I always have loved this place. Now, when I first moved here, unfortunately or fortunately, what most people do is you stay at a boarding house. And I found myself some accommodations at a boarding house that some of the people recommended up on the hill, some of my fellow congressmen. Well, it's a lovely place, but there's a lot of people there. And not only do you share a room, but oftentimes there's two or three of us in a single bed. It's rather crowded, but we do have great meals there. So it's a, it's, it's a nice place. So I, I go into, I go up to the, to the Capitol there, walk into the house the first day. I was expecting something, a certain amount of decorum to occur. And I was surprised to see, do you know that every one of those congressmen and senators up there carry in at least one or two guns, pistols? It's a downright raucous place up there. Well, it makes it kind of exciting for us people that are just sort of more of the quiet. Well, we just wanted to get the work done because we've always, in the moral family, we've always been dedicated to just getting good work done. My father, my grandfather, and my uncle are all blacksmiths, and we are just the kind of people that you give us a job and we will see it through. So that's what I believe about some of the legislation that I'm working on. I've had a lot of opposition to this legislation that we'll talk about, but I still believe that given enough, you just keep working at it and working at it, and eventually we'll get it through.
might also re remind you to remember when we talked a little bit later about my love of the buildings. I, I, this is something that I'd carry through the, uh, my whole life. Now, I want to go ahead and talk about a couple of the bills of legislation that I've been working on. Now, now remember, here's some of the political pressures that we have going on right now in this country, and this greatly influences these bills. Number one, we have a civil war going on. We have the North versus the South. A number of states, 13 states, that, that uh, came back from, uh, seceded from, from this country and, and decided to go their own ways, and President Lincoln said, no, you're not going to. We also have slavery. I talked four million slaves in this country. Not all of them are in the South. There's a number of slave states that are in the North. There is Kentucky, there is Maryland. Those are sta slave states that are considered border states. So you have slavery going on. You have uh, a terrible financial situation in this country. In 1837, you may remember, you may recall, and a number of you look like you might have been, been around in those days, the Panic of 1837. Roughly a quarter of all this country's banks went belly up. We had record numbers of foreclosures on homes. It was a terrible situation. And then we went into a depression that lasted from 1837 to 1847. Horrible, horrible situation. At the same time, you have the gold rush and people getting excited to move west. So you had all these people, a great migration of people moving west. Lots of things going on. Now, I will tell you, right now, in the report in 18, at the beginning of this year, 1862, the, tr the Secretary of the Treasurer gave us a report on how much money we have in the U.S. Treasury. $500,000. That's all we have in the Treasury at all. And guess what? We have a war, and wars cost millions of dollars, and we have to pay for the war. So we have a situation. The very first bill that I introduced, or one of the first bills that I introduced uh, just months ago and was passed on May the 15th of this year was to establish the United States Department of Agriculture as a cabinet level position. Now I have to say, you all may not be aware of this, but until recently, until that bill was signed, here is agriculture being the top occupation in this country, something that's very important. You live and breathe with agriculture. One representative, one individual in the federal government that would serve with agriculture, and he is down in the basement of the patent office in his one desk, and his job is to send out seed packets. That is the attention that this country gives to agriculture in terms of the federal government. No cabinet level position, no group of people working on it. Well, there's a number of groups that started getting excited, one of which, which meets over here at the Smithsonian Institute, and they had a meeting this past March, was of 1862, is the United States Agricultural Society. It, it's been formed for about 10 years now, and they do a number of things in terms of promoting agriculture and education. They actually have fairs, and they have a number of local and uh, state organizations that have fairs, and they have demonstration farms, and they actually get groups of farmers together, like yourselves, and go from farm to farm and see how you're doing things. And in fact, there's a little bit of competition goes on there because, of course, if you're having, you know, some of your neighbors coming over to see your place, you're going to fix it up because your place is going to be the best farm in that county. So there is some competition going on. I went over there and talked to them about my ideas about starting up this Department of Agriculture in March, and they were already working on some ideas and some language to send up to the Hill. But just as soon as they found out I was working on it, and I do have some influence up on the hill, they backed off and they said they didn't want to confuse those poor people up there on the hill with two different letters that they would just back off and let me uh, do my legislation for the, for the Department of Agriculture. And I can say that we were successful. And this past May, just last month, the President, President Lincoln, signed the bill 
Uh, and so now we have a Department of Agriculture. We have a commissioner, commissioner of agriculture. He gets, the big guy, he gets paid $3,000 a year. He is in the bill, says he can have a clerk. The clerk gets paid $2,000. And then he can choose to have scientists of any numbers, entomologists, statisticians. They had this idea of having an, some kind of a national agricultural st uh, statistics census or something that they were going to have. And so they started it then and everything else. So I'm guessing we're going to have just a little bit more than seed packets. Well, another bit of legislation, and this is what I'd like to spend some time on, is the, the bill that is up on the Hill right now. It is the Morrill Act to establish the land-grant colleges. Give you a little bit of background. If you're not familiar with this bill, and I hope you have, you know, I hope you, I have your support and you can talk to your congressmen, your senators up on the Hill, but it is for the transfer, it is for the transfer of 30,000 acres of land per your representative on the hill. Now, I told you that we only have $500,000 in the treasury. Now, it might have made more sense, and some people suggested we ought to just give each state some money as a grant to build an agricultural college. But unfortunately, we didn't have the money. We don't have the money. So it's my idea that we'll donate land, we'll grant land, federal public lands to the states. What they're to do with that is to sell the land at a dollar and a quarter. We're roughly talking about the ability to raise about seven million dollars. Sell that land at a dollar and a quarter an acre and use the money, put it into an account, make interest on it as an endowment and use the interest to buy and to build a college. Sounds like a pretty good idea, I believe. Now the problem is that there are some states that don't have enough public land. So what do you do about that? Well, for those states that don't have a lot of public land, let's say Vermont doesn't have a lot of public land. What you would do with states like Vermont and Connecticut and some of the other states is you would offer them scrip. That paper scrip is for so many acres of land. And then I, if I'm a representative from, what, say, Connecticut, I can go over to one of those western, far western states like Michigan, and, and I can actually trade those in for some of their public land. Now, one of the issues that we had here, there's a number of issues that I'll go, go through that people actually uh, say about this one. First of all, should we be educating the farmer at all? I will have to say that few people argue that we shouldn't be better educated, right? We should all know how to do things better. You know who, who, uh, who some of the big opponents of educating the farmer are? It's the farmer. How many people learn how to farm from a book? They don't learn how to farm from a book. You learn from how to farm by your father and your father's father and everything else. It's a tradition that's passed down as to how you learn about how to farm. It's trial and error. You try something, oops, it didn't work. And you try something else. Okay, how many people want their doctor to not have an education and just do things by trial and error? Sorry, sir, I'd cut off your arm, but I guess that's the wrong arm. We'll try the other one. And heaven forbid if any of y'all would uh, actually have to use a lawyer, but I would say that probably most people want the lawyer to go to school, be able to do things. Sorry, sir, I guess you get 50 years, and we'll try next time a little bit different tack because I didn't know anything about it. But so agriculture, this is something you're depending on for day to day. Your life sustenance is, is agriculture, so we ought to be sending people to school. Now, do you know that farmers didn't like that idea so much that a few, there's already a few agricultural colleges, but there's one up in Pennsylvania, some agricultural school up there in Pennsylvania, and you know what they call that school up there in Pennsylvania? They call it the Farmer's High School. 
Nobody wanted to be on farmers' college. They wouldn't want to no be known as a college for farmers. So they called, they thought it was a good idea to educate, but they called it the Farmers High School. You know, so we'll have to see whatever ends up with that, call, uh, that, that school up there. I have no idea. Okay, another thing that we get into is constitutionality. Who gives the right for the federal government to give land away? I told you there's only $500,000 in the, in, in the treasury there. Federal government ought to sell that land at big bucks. Sell it for development. Not just kind of give it away at a dollar and a quarter an acre. Then why are we doing that? The other thing is, we're giving people, these other states' lands away. Who gives us, the federal government, the right over the state power, states' rights? Who has the power, the state to control what goes on in their state? Or you got the federal government saying you can go over, if you're in Connecticut, you can go over and take over some of that land in, in Missouri or something. So there's people that really wondered about, about that and also about land for education. How could we, where does it say in the Constitution that we can give away land in the ed for education? It does say that the federal government can help on education. It has nothing to do with building colleges. And if it stipulates in the Constitution about education, then that means that if they would have had something else to say about education, they would have put it in there as well. So that means whatever it says in there about education is it, and we shouldn't even be dealing with federal government and education. That's just not our role. Well, I, I disagree with that, but at least that's some of the arguments. Now, that argument about coming into the states, that was a big deal in the South. Now, we tried this bill. I tried this bill in 1857 to get this bill through, and it was openly rejected by the by the, uh, the South and by the Western states and everything else. But you know what? Things have changed. What's changed, you might ask? Guess what? Those state senators and congressmen, they walked out of this Senate and House up there on the Hill last year when they seceded. What we have left is the North and the West. Now, the Western states, they're not too happy with this because they do feel like that we're just basically taking over their land. But in the end, I think that and they came around. And I will tell you to get kind of cut to the chase here that we have got my bill passed by both the Senate and the House. In the end, because the South left the Union, we were able to get the Department of Agriculture bill passed we were able to get this bill, the Moral Act for the Land Grant Colleges passed, and the only thing that we have now, what we lack, and we expect to happen in the next couple of days, is for the president to sign it. Now, I'll tell you a little secret here. Before the election, both Douglas Stevens, uh, Douglas and and uh, President Lincoln, they said, no matter how this election comes out and all, we promise that we'll sign the bill. So I guarantee that this bill is going to be signed. And you know why, I can get, why President Lincoln was so willing to do that? Something else you may not know is he's taken an attitude. He doesn't care what goes on up on the hill there. He just assumed the Congress do the legislation, and he's got bigger worries. We do have a civil war going on right now, and that's where the attention is. So I will say that I do fully expect in the next day or two that we'll have, and it actually turns out to be July 2nd, I believe that the president is going to sign the legislation. So that, that brings you up to date as to where we are now. Now, I'm going to step out of character for a second, or for, for the rest of the time, because I know I'm basically just about out of time. But I will say that, uh, pres or that uh, Congressman Morrill, his main passion was not education and agriculture so much as it was finances. And he went on, he had established the Tariff Act. He went on, he was the one responsible for the federal income tax. He's also, he had to pay for the war, millions of dollars for the war, and the president asked him for that. He also was the one that uh, he, he dealt with the land-grant colleges for the African-Americans, and that happened later on in the late 1800s. 
He was the Senator Byrd of his days, and when he died in office at the age of about 89, he was the longest serving individual to serve in, in the co com combination of the, of the House and the Senate when he died. So he was a real major icon in this country, and one that surprisingly a number of people don't know his history. However, if you go to any land-grant college, Michigan State University, uh, you know, uh, University of Nebraska, they'll have a building that is the Morrill Building, or Morrill Hall, named after Justin Smith Morrill. Thank you very much. you have any questions? Well, I appreciate your attention very much, and you have a good day.